In this episode of Restore It, I come to terms with the fact that doing full car restorations for customers whilst trying to run a YouTube channel at the same time is stressful AF. And so I'm pleased to announce that this will be the last customer car I do on the channel. Once this Mercedes is done, and it's nearly done as you're about to see in this episode, I'm going to focus on the 325i Sport until it's finished, and instead of full cars, Restore It will go back to being a fully functioning car part restoration business for those who want their parts restored to a very high level. I've done parts for people in the past through the channel, and I find those projects run as smoothly as any other project, even if I film it and make an episode. I think the difference between a customer's car and my own car is that the 325i Sport, for example, can be done in my own time and in my own way, which will be the way that's best for content, and not necessarily for getting the car done as soon as possible and back to a customer, whilst trying to get content at the same time. Another reason why customer cars don't really work for me is that not everybody wants or can afford a nut and bolt restoration, and in some ways I feel as if this causes more issues than just going back down to the bare chassis and starting from there, as expensive as that can be. With that said, I still have the job of finishing what I've started, and in this episode I've done my best to document the tying of many loose ends on this W123 to have it ready for painting, starting with the bits I removed from the engine bay. The control arms look about 40 years old, so they're getting replaced, but as for everything else, I'm going to do them in-house, starting with a good old blast to remove the rust and old coatings. Like most of the times I blast, I quickly get bored of using the built-in system and turn to the Sealy Pop Blaster, which yes gets the job done a lot quicker, but makes it almost impossible to see what's going on, especially on camera. I think what I'm going to do is invest in a bigger and better extraction system to make blasting a pleasure again. Because I want the zinc coating to appear as shiny as possible, I'm going to buff the now rust-free and matte surface on the wire wheel. For those bits I can't reach with the bench grinder, I'm going to use the rotary tool and some steel wire bits. With all of these bits shiny enough, I'm going to let them soak in the alkaline cleaner for about half an hour before rinsing them off and pickling them in a dry acid solution. One final rinse and I can now add some fresh zinc using Gatoros's 10 litre kit. Depending on the size and number of parts in the electrolyte, this usually takes anywhere from 20 minutes to about an hour to apply a good coating of zinc. Whilst that's doing its thing, I'm going to begin the painting process for these covers that came from the engine bay. For whatever reason, I didn't manage to film the rest of this process, but you'll see them later down the line once the car is painted. With those on their way, I can now passivate the newly plated parts. I make it seem as if all of this runs smoothly as one continuous stream of progress, but I'm sure some of you know it's not like that at all. Zinc plating a lot of parts can take eons. It doesn't always go right, and even if it does, it's a slow process. But that's because it's not the cheapest endeavor to go alone. I've had some advice to outsource the zinc plating recently, and it's something I'm considering, simply because of the time it takes me to do it, and the results aren't always that consistent. Some of you might be able to tell that these parts aren't as shiny as they should be, and the finish isn't as deep as one would like it. Putting that aside for now, there are a lot of other things to be thinking about, like finally finishing off all of the welding work underneath and inside the car. What's needed is some new sprayable MS sealer, some kind of black wax oil to match what's already there, some seam sealer and soundproofing for the inside. I'm going to start with the one I'm most excited about because I've never done it before, and that's the sprayable MS sealer. It took a bit of faffing to find the right nozzle, and about a quarter of a tube to get the hang of it and dial in the settings. But once it was right, I had a whale of a time. Cue the undercoating montage.
I've made it look as if I have the easy life and it all went to plan. But actually, I ran out about halfway and had to wait a few days for a second tube to arrive. But for your viewing pleasure, I didn't run out and everything went completely to plan. After a bit of practice, I feel as if I got quite close to the factory thickness and look I was going for. I'm going to let this dry for a few days before I cover it in Tetraseal wax oil. So whilst that's drying, I want to quickly tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Camus. Camus are an interesting company based in Shenzhen. When they started in 2008, they specialised in aftermarket gauges for things like boost pressure, oil pressure, water temp, or pretty much anything you wanted. But since then, they've moved on to building and selling a fully electric sports car, a range of electric go-karts, and most recently, sim racing rigs. And they are starting off strong with this eSports 50Nm direct drive base that comes with a universal bosket attachment, meaning you can add any steering wheel you like, with or without a quick release. And as cool as that is, Camus do offer a range of their own that come with their very nice magnetic carbon shifter paddles. I'm really getting into sim racing recently, and after testing one of these out, I was quite impressed with the amount of adjustments that can be made either on the computer or wirelessly via a smartphone. Camus also offer all of the other bits you'd expect from a sim racing company, full rigs, pedals, e-brakes, shifters and so on. So if you're interested in sim racing or want to get into direct drive for a little bit less than your average brand, check out Camus at the links below and use code RESTORIT for 5% off your order. And finally, for RESTORIT viewers only, Camus are giving away a free wheel and base combo to one lucky winner who likes their Facebook page before the 31st of July 2022. The links are down in the description and liking the page will automatically enter you into a draw for a chance to win. So good luck to everyone who enters, and thanks to Camus for sponsoring the episode. Let's get back to the Mercedes. I'm using brush on Tetraseal wax oil to cover the fresh MS sealer and make it look as if no one's ever been there. I think we need another montage to get us through this painfully slow process. And yes I know, there's a sprayable version, I'm just using up what I've got to keep the cost down for everyone involved. This went on for so long, my camera refused to capture any more of it. So moving on, the zinc parts are now dry and ready to fit, along with the new upper control arms. It was at this point that the sway bar brackets were reinstalled, as well as the steering box and the steering column. One thing I haven't really shown you is all of the cleaning and re-blacking of the underside of the car. It's really hard to film and it takes absolutely ages. But with it pretty much finished, I can now reinstall the differential and get the car properly back on its wheels for the first time in a long time. The output shafts were added to the diff on the workbench so all three bits can be installed in one go. And this is done by resting it on a jack and removing the output shafts into place first, followed by the diff and then its mounting bracket. I had a bit of help with this one because it's almost impossible doing it alone. Just like with most things, it was much easier removing it 
than it was putting it back in, but we got there in the end. The next job on my list is to cover all of the new metal on the inside with the brushable seam sealer. I'm doing this by first dabbing the sealer on to make sure there are no air bubbles, and then the second coat was brushed on like paint. Another thing I didn't film was the fitting and aligning of the front wings. Because one, it was an absolute faff to say the least, and two, they are becoming back off again for painting and the rebuild. But now they're on, that's one less thing to think about, and I'm really starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. The only bits left that need tetraseal are the sides of the seals. Here it's much thinner than on the underside, so I used a lot less and spread it as thin as I could. I have no idea how I did this, but I put the masking tape on in the wrong place to begin with, and only realised now. With all of that done, I can now put all of the wheels back on, so it can roll to and from the paint shop. There are, however, a few things I need to do before it can go off for painting. One of which is the final body work, which I'll be getting help with, and also replacing the soundproofing and vibration damping that was removed for the welding. I'm using Dynamat Extreme, which handles both soundproofing and vibration dampening all in one handy sheet. I'm using some cardboard to make templates so I can cut the Dynamat to the right size with as least faffery as possible. With the driver's side going well, I moved to the passenger side and realised I might need a bit more dynamat than I thought. This old soundproofing is definitely at least 38 years old, and is about as brittle as it could be. I'm going to remove and replace a lot more of it when I get some more sheets in, but for now, this will do. If you can remember back to a few episodes ago, the front windscreen corners were the last bit of welding work I did. This is the filler from that last episode. It's been about three weeks, so I think it might be dry now. This is a great example of what happens when you take on too much at once. Things get left halfway through or forgotten about altogether. I've learned a lot taking this on, and let's just say I'm really looking forward to getting it finished and fully focusing on the 325i Sport like I've never done before. With that done, and staying on the theme of the front windscreen, I've needed to remove the old sealant for a while now, I just haven't found a product for the job. Annoyingly, it's super thick, seriously stuck on, and there's loads of it. Thankfully, I've just found this glue and tar remover from Genolite that absolutely destroys it in seconds without damaging the paint underneath. With one spray and a small brush, it instantly turns the sealant into a liquid and makes what would have been an hour long nightmare into a five minute easy job. I was genuinely surprised at how well this worked.
The one thing it couldn't get rid of were these bits of actual rubber from the old windscreen seal that have bonded to the paint over the course of 38 years. I couldn't even remove this easily with a blade. It's so stuck on, I can't get it off with anything. As it's only happened along the top edge, I think it must have been the sun on hot days over the course of nearly 40 years. So to get rid of it, I've opted for sandpaper and eventually filler to smooth it back out. As I was cleaning the last of the sealant from the bottom lip of the windscreen, I've noticed some surface rust right in the middle that needs grinding down and treating. Whilst I was getting the tar and glue remover, I was speaking with someone at Genlite and discovered that the aerosol version of their rust converter has epoxy in it, making it an ideal bare metal coating. I cleaned the area down with silicone remover before applying a few coats of the converter and then primer. For the final layer of filler, I'm using some Evercoat Rage Ultra I picked up from Spray Guns Direct. This stuff is actually what it says on the tin. It's the easiest sanding filler I've ever had the pleasure of using. Most of the bodywork was done by Bobby from Vehicle Paintwork Specialists, who are going to be painting the car in about a week's time. I started both the front windscreen repairs but even they were finished by Bobby. If I was painting it, I'd also want to do the final prep as that's the thing that's going to show through the most. While that filler is drying, I'm going around the car finishing off little bits like this repair under the seatbelt bracket. After cleaning the area, I'm using some manganese brown base coat and a black aerosol to cover the grey seam sealer. As I was working there, I noticed some more surface rust hiding on the top of the sill in the middle of the door. So like before, I'm going to grind it back to bare metal, treat it and fill it, so it can be painted over on the day of the full respray. With those two ticked off, I can now sand down the dream filler and have it ready for Bobby's final touches. The same went for the boot lid. For some reason, this area suffered quite a bit of surface rust, most of which was dealt with off camera for one reason or another. 
The whole car now needs DAing with 320 grit as well as a few final final touches and it will be ready to paint next episode. Once it's painted it's simply a case of putting it all back together again bar a few little problems that we'll sort out once we get there. And there we go, pretty much ready for paint. The front wings are sorted, the seals are looking fresh, 99% of the bodywork is done, 99% of the undercoating is done, the differential and prop shaft are back in, all of the arches have been cleaned and protected, all of the welding work has been finished off on the inside of the car and new soundproofing has been added, the front suspension and steering have been installed, the engine bay has been painted, and let's not forget the 20 separate rust repairs are now all finished. Before I could head home on this particular day, Bobby arrived to do a bit of priming over the areas that have been filled. There's nothing too exciting here, but I'm looking forward to filming the full respray for next episode and having it back in the workshop with the main goal of putting everything back on and getting it back on the road. So if you're as excited as I am to get this finished and get back to the E30s for good, make sure you're subscribed to see the return of the 325i Sport and some classic Restorer episodes. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.